Part 6 Godrek, choked Felix. They're not men. I know that man, Ling, said Godrek, cracking another in the head so hard that the helmet flew off and cracks appeared in the stone cranium. Men don't get up when I hit them. But the thing kept on fighting. As the caliph cowered and the sorcerer chanted, the stone men chopped the rebels to pieces. Behind the fighting, the bolts of the throne room doors groaned and buckled. The palace guard was almost inside. The sorcerer's droning chant began buzzing strangely in Felix's ears, and suddenly he could barely keep his eyes open. His arms felt leaden. He wasn't alone either. All along the rebel line, the men of Halim were dying as their arms dropped, and the stone men buried their tulwars in their chests. This won't work, sorcerer, growled Godrek. Not without drugging me first. He tripped the stone man to the floor and leapt over it, swinging for Kadik. The sorcerer yelped and dodged behind the throne of the caliph. Godric gave chase. The sleepy buzz vanished instantly from Felix's mind, and he saw Halim's men recover themselves as well. But it made little difference. The stone men could not be stopped. Swords did nothing. Heavier weapons might have knocked them down, but they fought on just as strongly. Push up day called Kadik, dancing awkwardly away from Godrek. Protect me! Kill the dwarf! But before the stone man could turn, Godrek flung his truncheon again. It caught the sorcerer in the knees and he crashed, shrieking, beside the dais. At the same time, with a final bash of the battering ram, the throne room door exploded open, and a flood of white-armored guards poured in, charging the rebels. Godrek stood over Kadik. Truncheon raised. Get in my head, will you? He roared and smashed down. The iron shod club stove in Kadik's skull like an eggshell. Godric laughed evilly. Ha! Now I am in yours. The stone men clattered to the ground like unstrung puppets, all life gone from them. Relieved, Felix and the rebels turned to fight the palace guards, but they were so few now, and the guards were so many that their destruction seemed inevitable. Gatrek swung his truncheon at the caliph, but it swerved in the air and missed him. No, cried Halim. Iron won't touch him. He leapt onto the dais, swinging the basal-studded club. It caught Falhedar on the shoulder and knocked him down. Strangely, the crown stayed firm on the head. Halim leapt on the caliph and grabbed the crown, tugging at it. But it wouldn't come off. In a glance behind him, Felix saw that it was soon to Falhedar's scalp, threads going through the skin. You coward! Halim pulled harder and the crown came away, ripping flesh and hair with it. The caliph shrieked, his head a ragged bloody mess. Yule stepped up before him, curved dagger held high. For my father, she said, and plunged it into his heart. For my country! said Halim, and sank his blade next to hers. All around the room, the white-clad guards faltered and blinked around, as if waking from a dream. The rebels knocked their blades aside and tore into them. Halim stood, Falhadar's bloody crown in one hand. Stop, my friends! It is over! The rebels stepped away reluctantly, but they did not lower their swords. Halim addressed the bewildered guards. Loyal men of the palace, the yoke of the serpent crown has been lifted from your shoulders. Your wills are your own again. He gestured to the bodies at his feet. Caliph Falhadar is dead. The red sorcerer is dead. You no longer need to fight to protect them. Instead, I invite you to join me and return our land to its former glory. He was met by silence. The guards seemed too stunned to respond. At last, the captain of the guard gathered his wits. And under what crown will you rule? He asked sullenly. The serpent or the lion? Halim looked down at the bloody crown in his hands. He seemed to hesitate, and then threw it away from him savagely. It chimed as it skipped across the marble floor. The lion crown, he said. Only the lion. 
The captain looked at his fellows. They seemed as suspicious as he was. He turned back to Halim. From now on we follow the man, not the crown. Prove yourself a lion, and we will follow. Halim bowed. And that is all that I ask. Halim, called Gal. They say this and you trust them. Slay them before they change their minds. I trust them more for this honesty than if they kissed my feet and swore a thousand oaths, Halim said. He turned to Godric and Felix. Come, my friends, the lion crown is in the vault, along with your weapons. He took a strange key from Falhedar's belt and started across the throne room. Gull, call peace at the front gate, and let in the rest of our brothers. Yule, go with them, your presence will win over any holdouts. I, beloved, said Yule. I, Halim, said Gull begrudgingly. Godric and Felix followed Halim out of the room. The door to the caliph's treasure vault was a slab of iron-bound stone, secured with bolts, bars, and magical wards. Halim slid the four shafts of the rune-inscribed key, one gold, one silver, one iron, one a slim rod of jade, into a four-holed lock set in a steel plate in the center of the door, then turned it right, left, and right again. With a ratcheting of clockwork, the bars raised, the bolts withdrew, and the door rose up into the ceiling. Godric sneered. Bah, human gimmickry. He and Felix stepped with Halim through the door into a glittering grotto of treasure. The vault was enormous, bigger than a throne room, and doors in each wall opened up into other rooms. Felix had never seen so much wealth and art gathered in one place before. Bound chests were stacked to head height along the walls. Rugs and statues and weapons and full suits of armor rose in haphazard mounds, through which wound narrow paths. Books with gilded bindings spilled from overflowing shelves. Vases and urns and gold and silver lamps cluttered every corner, as well as spyglasses and maps and clockwork toys, jewels and crowns and scepters. In one corner there was a silver barred cage, in which, confusingly, was locked a carpet. A statue of a monkey with a very superior smirk gazed at him from another corner. On a tall onyx stand in the center of the mess was an alabaster rag that seemed to glow from within with an inner fire. And these were just the first things that caught his eye. Halim sighed. Somewhere among all this is my crown and your weapons. Felix groaned. Godric started forward, his one eye glittering as he took in the mountains of treasure. He licked his lips. Let us get started, then. The others followed him. Be careful, said Halim. I am told that after I left his service, Falhadar placed a guardian in the vault. What kind of guardian? asked Felix, nervously looking around. I know not, Halim shrugged. But it should only be released if the protective wards are broken. Since we entered with the key, it should not trouble. A deafening clang interrupted him. They spun around. A heavy iron portcullis had dropped down to block the exit. Part 7 Halim stared at the portcullis. That is not supposed to happen unless invaders have breached the door. An ugly laugh echoed from above. They looked up. A dark balcony ran above the door, some kind of guard platform. Gull grinned down from it. It was hard to see him clearly in the shadows, for there seemed to be streaks of red on his face, and something strange on his head. Imprisoned again, he chortled. And this time you won't escape alive. Gull, cried Halim, what are you playing at? I couldn't believe it when you returned, Gal growled. I had worked so hard to have you arrested. Then it would have been me who stormed the palace, me who liberated the country, me who was crowned the caliph, me who married the beautiful Yule. An evil smile spread across his face and he beckoned behind him. Well, now it will be me. A pair of Gal's men stepped forward. Yule struggled between them, wrist-bound, mouth-gagged. 
You lay, Halim called. Really, sir, you fool. Do you think the others will stand for this? Gaul stepped forward, and Felix saw it was the serpent crown he wore on his hand, still crusted with blood and dangling hairy scraps of Falhadar's scalp. The others are in my power, he said, and my palace guard is slaughtering your beggar army as we speak. He touched the crown. You were a fool to leave this behind. He took something out of his belt. Also this. He raised the object to his lips. It was the silver flute of Kadik. Gaul was no musician, but he was able to pipe a simple tune on the thing, shrill and loud. Halim scowled, confused. Nursery tunes? Are you mad as well as a fool? Gaul stopped playing and grinned down at him. Did no one tell you of Kadik's new pet? Have you not heard the nature of the guardian of the vault? Pet? said Halim, and looked worriedly from door to door. What kind of pet? Gaul only laughed and resumed playing his piercing tune on the flute. Friends, Halim said to Godric and Felix. I fear... There was a crash from the right-hand room and a low hissing. Halim and Felix froze. Godric looked up, but continued searching methodically through the treasure. Another crash came, and then a scraping, like a coat of heavy chainmail being dragged across the floor. Felix saw movement through the arch. A blunt, poison-green snakehead the size of a rowboat dug through the door, followed by a neck like a flexible tree trunk. Huge yellow eyes blazed as it swung angrily from side to side, knocking suits of armor and statues flying. It didn't appear to like Gaul's music, but the melody seemed to goad it as well. It saw the men and the dwarf and lunged at them, jaws snapping. Its fangs were as long as Felix's forearms. Its tail had yet to come through the door. Godric and Felix dived left and right. Felix crashed into a silver cage that contained the carpet. As he stood, he almost thought the rug had flapped at him and strained angrily at the silver bars. He edged away from the strange thing and returned his attention to Halim, who was slashing at the snake's flank with a found sword. The steel turned harmlessly on the thick scales. The snake twisted back to reach him, its snout clubbed him to the ground and then darted forwards, jaws distending. Gotrek hauled Halim out of the way just in time. He was unconscious, a great bruise growing on his forehead. Felix found a tasseled spear and jabbed into the snake's side, shouting to draw its attention. The tip pierced the scales an inch, but no more. The snake hissed and reared up, turning on him. Felix scrambled behind a cluster of statues. Gull's flute squealed, and the snake shot after Felix. Gudrek jumped on the serpent, riding it like a horse, and battered it with his truncheon. The blows did nothing but annoy it. It left off chasing Felix to double up and snap at Godric. The slayer bashed it on the nose and it reared back in pain, bucking him to the floor. Gull piped even louder, and the snake returned to the attack. Godric, don't fight the snake, Felix cried. Stop the flute. Felix cast the spear he held. Gull flinched away as it struck the wall beside him, his melody faltering, and the snake slowed its attack. Godric saw the connection. He picked up a heavy jeweled bracelet and flung it. Gull ducked. Felix threw an entire set of golden dishes, one after the other, denting them irreparably. Godric hurled a ruby the size of a baby's fist. Chips flew as it struck the wall. Gull gaped and lowered the flute. My treasure! You're destroying my treasure! The snake calmed the very instant he stopped playing. Gull cursed and resumed, shriller and quicker than before. The snake cringed like a whipped slave, but turned back to Godric and Felix. Felix slung jade pieces as he dodged away from its teeth. One caught Gull on the forehead and he staggered, but kept playing. Godric dived over the snake's coils and came up beside the onyx stand in the center of the room. He grabbed the alabaster egg and heaved it. Gull bellowed. No, not the phoenix egg! He threw aside the flute and lunged forward to catch the egg. It glanced off his thumb and he bobbled it, eyes wide, and then finally trapped it between his hands. He breathed a sigh of relief and set it down carefully on the floor. The snake nosed half-heartedly into Felix. 
"'You are only delaying the inevitable, fools!' shouted Gull, snatching up the flute again and beginning to play. A dreadful squawking honk blared out of it. The snake jerked its head up and turned on him, hissing angrily. Gull swallowed and looked at the flute. Throwing it aside, had kinked it and crumpled its delicate silver bell. He tried to bend it back into position and then blew it again, but the noise was even worse, a farting, unmusical bleat. The snake shot towards him, scattering heaps of treasure as it came. Gull backed away, toddling madly. The snake kept coming, enraged by the horrible noise. Gull threw down the flute and screamed, but the snake did not desist. It had found its tormentor at last. Its head snapped forward. Gull shrieked as the huge jaws crushed him and shook him like a rat. The serpent crown flew from his head and fell into the vault. Halim recovered consciousness just in time to see Gull disappearing into the snake's maw. By the spirits of earth, he murmured, horrified. Free from the crown's influence, Gull's men ran from the balcony in terror. Yule did too. It is my axe, shouted Gautrek. Felix turned. The snake's passage had caused an avalanche of treasure to spill across the floor and on top of it was Godric's axe and Felix's dragon-hilted sword. They grabbed their weapons and turned. The snake had swallowed Gull whole and was pushing through the balcony door after Yule. No! Halim staggered up unsteadily and hacked at its tail with his scimitar, but the snake didn't even notice. Stay back, manling, said Godric. He raised his axe over his head and swung down mightily. The blade bit deep into the snake's flesh, cutting it to the bone. The snake spasmed and hissed, squirming backward out of the doorway to turn to face this savage attack. Its head shot down at Gautrek like a meteor, jaws gaping. The slayer rolled aside and the snake scooped up a mouthful of golden treasure. Felix slashed at it and opened an angry wound in its side. Perhaps it was that the snake was some mundane kin to dragons, but a ruined sword seemed to cut through its flesh like hot wax. The snake hissed and turned, massive head looming above him. That's it, Man Leng, called Gautrek. Distracted. Distracted, Felix thought, as he dived away from the slavering jaws. His death might distract it, for a second. He rolled under a low table. The snake's snout upended the table and came on. Felix ran into a wall. There was nowhere to go. He swung his sword desperately. The snake reared back for the kill. Die, you serpent! Gautrek roared and ran up the snake's arching neck to its massive head. He swung off balance. The axe exploded the snake's left eye, splashing yellow jelly everywhere. The snake buckled in agony, hissing, and Gautrek crashed shoulder first onto the stone floor. The snake whipped down at him, its jaw snapped shut, and the slayer was gone. Felix stared. It was like a magic trick. One moment Gautrek was there, lying in a heap against the wall, and the next moment he vanished. Part 8 Felix looked up at the snake, rising up and tipping its head back. A thick lump was making its way down its gullet. Halim, he called, rushing forward. Help me, we have to get him out, we have to... Something bright appeared in the center of the snake's throat, a sharp wedge of metal. The beast writhed and twisted, hissing in agony. A line of red appeared around the steel wedge. It lengthened and widened as the steel slid further down the snake's length. The snake flopped to the ground, coiling and uncoiling in violent death spasms. Felix and Halim dodged and ran as its tail beat the ground, pulverizing a fortune in golden treasure. The wedge pushed further out through the snake's flesh, revealing it to be an axe. It was followed by an arm, and then another arm, prying the two edges of the wound wide. And then an ugly head with an eye patch poked out, and then Gautrek shouldered his way out of the snake's still-twitching body. His crest was splattered to the skull, and he glistened with blood and mucus. He coughed and spat and noisily cleared his nose, and then grinned evilly at Halim. Gull says hello. You, said Halim. Dwarf, I... Then he burst out laughing. Felix joined him. 
I thought, he said, I really thought that this time... Godric only sneered. A common snake? Do you insult me? A rattle of chains made them turn. The portcullis that blocked the vault was rising, and Yule ran through, still bound and gagged. Beloved, said Halim, striding to her. He cut her ropes and tore off her gag, and they embraced. Godric and Felix turned to give them some privacy, and Godric mopped his face with a cloth of gold scarf. Now, friends, said Halim, turning from Yule after a long moment. The Lion Crown! They spread out and searched the six rooms of the vault, until, finally, Yule found it, shoved it into a mahogany cabinet. Halim took it with trembling fingers. It was a beautiful thing, simple but elegant. A circular silver band set at the front with a carved amber lion head, out of which gazed deep emerald eyes. This, this, he said, is the true heart of Ras Karim. As they walked back to the vault door, stepping around the motionless body of the giant snake, Halim saw the fallen serpent crown. He stooped and picked it up, and then stood looking from one crown to the other. Destroy it, beloved, said Yule, staring at the cobra-headed circlet with distaste. Destroy it so it may never tempt us again, or any other caliph for that matter. Halim hesitated. He looked toward the door. Gull may have not been the only conspirator. We may be surrounded by traitors. The palace guard may turn against us. What if we have need of its protection, of its power? Yule stared at him, eyes troubled. Then it will not be Gull who the snake devoured, but you. And it will be Gull who walks out of this room, not you. Felix coughed. It didn't do much to protect Falhadar from you, did it? In fact, it seems to have inspired you to overthrow him. Put it on, and there will be another Halim who will rise to overthrow you. Halim frowned, still uncertain, but finally he sighed. You are right. It has to be destroyed. It is an evil thing that wants too much to be worn. I will destroy it as soon as... Again he hesitated. As soon as... He cursed. No, it is too tempting. It must be done now. He turned to Godric. Friend dwarf, your axe has slain one serpent today. Now slay another, please. He threw the bloody crown on the floor before the slayer. Godric nodded and lashed down with his axe. With a flash of green flame, the crown was split in two. The others stepped away. The two halves of the thing sizzled and melted into a puddle of black slag. Bah, magic, sneered Godric, disgusted. Halim blinked at the smoldering black mess and then nodded. Thank you, friend dwarf. You have done us a great service. He lifted his head and squared his shoulders. Come, let us see what fate awaits us in the throne room. Part 9 Four days later, Godric and Felix stood with Halim and Yule outside the stables of the Caliph's palace, their palace now. There had been a wedding and a coronation. Yule, the last of the line of the old Caliphs, had crowned Halim with the lion crown, and then knelt with him before the high priest of Ras Karim to be pronounced man and wife, and Caliph and Queen, as the multitudes cheered outside the great gold dome temple in the center of the city. Now the newlyweds bowed to the poet and the slayer. My friends, Halim said, we could have not done this without you. He touched his hand and chest. Truly, all might have gone very differently had you not been there. Even at my moment of determination, the crown tempted me. Had you not been there to destroy it? We are indebted to both of you, said Yule who looked every inch a queen, in flowing blue robes and sapphires in her black hair. Godric shrugged. Ah, it was only a snake. The snake was the least of it, said Halim, grinning. As you well know, he turned and clapped his hands. We have gifts for you, 
to aid you in your hunt of the lurking horror. A servant came forward leading a camel. Its humped back was piled with trunks and packs and water skins. Also these, said Yule, taking a small pouch from her robes. Gold and gems enough to take you around the world. She pressed the pouch into Felix's hand. Though you are welcome to stay here for as long as you wish. Felix wouldn't have minded that in the least. With the rebellion over, the palace was a beautiful, peaceful place, full of fountains, gardens, and delectable women. No, thank you, said Godric. We've stayed long enough already. He saluted the royal couple in the dwarf fashion, fist over heart. Felix sighed and bowed resignedly. Godric had never been one to relax and enjoy the good times while they lasted. A short while later, Godric and Felix led the camel through the dusty streets of Raskarim on the way to the city gate. Felix looked around with interest, taking in all the curious customs, the unusual architecture and the unintelligible script of the signs. More for my journals, he said. It always amazes me, the infinite variation of man's many cultures. How strange and alien the customs, how odd... Bah, rubbish! grunted Godric. Man is the same everywhere, only the hats are different. He picked up his pace, tugging on the camel's bridle. Now, hurry up, manling, I've got a monster to slay. The End You've listened to The Two Crowns of Ras Karim A Godric and Felix short story written by Nathan Long